A warm welcome to Alan's Allotment, guys. If it's your first time along here, please do consider hitting the subscribe button and the little bell icon on the right. And every time I put up a new video, you'll be alerted. This channel pre uh, is a bit of a mixed bag. Um, we have rare coloured racing pigeons, we have racing pigeons, we have fantails, we have a no dig growing area uh, that we transformed, and we have a polytunnel. We also do several DIY projects on this uh, channel, guys. Not all of them are successful, some are a complete disaster, but follow me along and you'll see. Um, it's no holds barred, basically. If I make a mistake on these videos, you get to see it in all its glory and you get a laugh at my expense. I don't mind, and I hope you enjoy the videos, guys. To all my subscribers currently, a massive thank you as always. And as I say, if you're new here, guys, please do consider hitting the subscribe button and the little bell icon on the right, and that would be much appreciated. I'll see you later, guys. A warm welcome to Alan's allotment. Today is Saturday the 1st of August. Wow, it really is flying in this year guys. 1st of August already. Right, um, I still have one video that I haven't got uploaded yet, but I'm hoping to get that done over this weekend. Um, so, a bit of an update. Um, yesterday being Friday, um, I was round at Morrison's getting a few odds and sods. And I couldn't resist, and I bought a uh, further two nectarine trees, the little dwarf trees. So I now have a peach dwarf, a uh, two nectarine dwarf, and I have a cherry and a pear. So we put the cherry tree and the pear tree outside, and they're positively thriving. We stripped off the bad leaves that were on them and uh, they are positively thriving just outside the polytunnel at this moment in time. But the peach tree is being left inside the polytunnel because the peach trees are susceptible to something called leaf curl. Uh, and if they get that, then basically the plant dies. Um, they're also imported from Spain, these, because the writing that's on the actual labelling is Spanish. Uh, so I'm going to take it that they've been imported from uh, Spain. So they've obviously came, uh, came from a, a totally tropical climate through to England. And uh, that would be a shock to them in, in itself. So, um, yeah. All in all, they've survived the journey and they don't look too bad. Uh, as I say, I picked, I went down yesterday, there was only a handful of these little dwarf trees left. So I picked um, the two best small nectarine trees. And... After doing so, it suddenly, as I say, it suddenly dawned on me that these, uh, the, all the peach variety are susceptible to leaf curl if they get wet. So if the foliage gets wet, because as you know, in Spain it doesn't rain very often, guys, but uh, here we, it's, it's every other day or every other hour. You, we, you can't predict it. So they're probably going to need to be kept under cover. Then I thought, right, that means sacrificing some of the polytunnel. Then as they grow up, they might pierce the plastic and all the rest of it. So bit of a dilemma, I thought, right, I've already bought them, what am I going to do? Um, so if I know, I'll build myself another small greenhouse, um, house only the trees. I've also got, if they, if they arrive, um, I ordered them for the end of August, um, a lemon tree, an orange tree, and a lime tree. So at least those three... Uh, the orange, lemon and lime and the two nectarine and peach are going to need to be protected somewhat in winter. So they, I decided I would build an 8 foot by 6 foot greenhouse uh, with two 2 foot beds, three in one bed, three in the other bed. But the dilemma I had was, well where the heck am I going to put this other greenhouse? 
Anyways, I was up here Friday evening, yesterday at the allotment, and racking my brain what I could do, where I could put it, all the rest of it, and give it some protection as well from the gills that we get up here. So I finally came up with the idea, guys, that where the trailer is next to the garage, I give the trailer to my son, Tony, and I'm just waiting for him to take that out of the way. And where that is, I'm going to claim back that space, eight foot along the garage, by six foot extension, and it still leaves me a two foot path to get a wheelbarrow around with the cow manure onto the beds. And uh, it's all sort of working out quite nice. So today, uh, this morning, I'm a little bit later getting up, it's, it's now 11.30, but this morning I went uh, to the local hardware store and what I've done is I've got myself uh, five six foot PVC corrugated sheets for the roof because I'm conscious that the crows and seagulls and whatever you peck holes in plastic so I do actually have two brand spanking new five meter by four meter uh, like polytunnel covers uh, and braided as well but what I don't want is them pecking holes in that and it leaking through onto the peaches and nectarines. Um, so I decided that the best way to go for the roof, certainly, would be this PVC corrugated sheeting. They can peck at that to the heart's content. I haven't seen them get through it yet. Mind there's a first time for everything. And then I have some 4mm um, um, polycarbonate sheeting in the other shed that I purchased two years ago. Um, and basically I use some of it for the doors on this polytunnel, uh, as you've seen, which I can close off at winter. And I think I have sufficient that I can make, uh, these are four feet by two feet wide. So if it's eight foot long, that will need four for the front, three for each side. Um, so roughly ten, I, I think I still have a pack of ten. I'm hoping I've still got a pack of ten. I don't have to buy another one or two just to finish the job. So I've bought the plastic corrugated sheeting. Um, I've decided the bottom, what I'm going to do is going to make it half and half. So the bottom half of the uh, greenhouse is going to be tin sheet on 2x2 framing or 3x2 framing, whichever. I haven't decided yet. Um, so the bottom half the height of a tin sheet and maybe even a half sheet cut down. I don't know yet, I've, I've got to weigh it up. But I want the four foot half at the top um, with windows, just windows all round and the translucent roof. So um, that's my intentions guys, I've got to build that. Uh, so that's coming up in the next video or two. However, I can't start it today as much as I would like to. I can't start that today because I don't have any 2x2 timbers and I think I only have three, three by two timbers behind this other pile of wood that I bought, which is for the project of the bed that I'm going to put in that little bit of a spare area. I actually toyed with the idea to put the, the, the um, greenhouse in that area, but it's not quite as big as I thought it was. And if I put an eight, eight foot by six foot greenhouse on there, then one, it's more exposed to the elements and there's nothing to bolt it against, which is the garage. By using the garage as well, one side's already created. I only need one side and two end pieces. Um, but yeah, it wasn't quite big enough to accommodate it there, and it would have been far more exposed to the gills. So that was the most practical solution for the uh, new greenhouse. Uh, and it will purely and simply be just for um, the little dwarf trees. And we might put some shelving at a higher level, just narrow shelves just to take seed trays and seedlings uh, we might do use we might do that as well guys that's all maybes so we'll wait and see how that pans out guys and that's a project that will be coming up so follow me along on that so sorry i've babbled on a bit anyway um the the other 50 bamboos have arrived and i've put them over in the pen next to the garage ready to go in the garage um, I'm not going to split them out of the wrapping because I don't need to. I just put them in the garage and they're there when I need them. Um, and the plastic corrugated sheeting. Now, ironically, I went into the uh, store today and I got these five sheets of the six foot 
translucent corrugated sheeting and they were priced up at £7.50 each and there was three more identical exactly the same size excuse me guys and they were marked up at £10 each uh, sorry ten ninety five each so obviously the price of these things are going up and that's the new stock that's came in and they're priced at ten ninety five. so it was obvious the choice I made I thought I only need four but there's only five left at the old price I might as well have all five in case I make a wrong cut or something like that so we've got all five guys right um, today I'm going to be taking the two youngsters off the ice bar hen and putting them in that loft with the, uh, with the three browns um, so that'll be getting done today and I'm not entirely sure what else I'm going to do but you'll just have to follow me along and see how it goes guys for now stay with me and I'll catch you later something else I done last weekend which I didn't actually show in the last video I don't think um, we watered down all these strawberries again and we collected everything off these steps where they got decimated put them all in the tray and as you see I have some of this mesh hanging up uh, in this bit of a makeshift area uh, do you know something? I'm just thinking I could convert this into uh, into a, a secondary greenhouse, but the th trouble is, is getting into that shed. Uh, that's the problem. Anyways, so I had a bit of a, a half sheet left over from when I was making the nest box grills, if you remember, guys. And so what I decided to do was just lean that against there, and I had this up here, and I put a, a bit of an end piece on there to try and protect them, and it seems to have worked. Um, this is the little sucker that it has actually taken off the plant that got decimated. It has actually uh, got rooted and taken. That's the other little sucker there. Not only has it put flowers out, it's got a strawberry or two on, but I should really cut them off and let it get established. And this is the plant that got decimated. As you can see, it's now starting to come back. So that's good. Uh, and we do still have strawberries on here as well, guys, look. We are still getting strawberries off these, so they've been cropping for quite a while. Okay, not a massive amount, because they're still pod bound in, in, in essence, they're, they're being contained. Imagine if I put them into a bed, the crop I might have had this year, but I'm not complaining. Everything that's come off them is very tasty, um, and I would say I've had 40, maybe 50 strawberries so far off these, and very nice they are too. Right guys, just a quick look at the uh, little cherry tree. And as you can see, looking really, really nice. We had a good downpour of rain last night again. And obviously it's watered it in. Uh, but yeah. So this one's the cherry. Uh, and these are fine outside. But yeah. And then this one's the pear. And again, looking really nice. And even a tiny wee bit of new growth on the top here, guys. Um, but yeah, as I say, w when I got them, I did actually strip out any bad leaves. And oh, that's a nice sign. Look at that. The little ladybird there, guys. That's the first one I've seen in the garden this year. We're going to leave that on there, guys. Excellent. Well, maybe there's some aphids on there that I'm unaware of. Anyways. A little ladybird will soon prepare to that. So yeah, just these these are basically just outside on the hard ground um, so that they can retain moisture in the pots when they do get watered. And they're actually uh, doing fine out here. They've been out here for uh, since about Tuesday evening. Basically it was getting too cluttered in the polytunnel, guys. So I'll give you a quick look in here now. And as you can see, they're like triffids. Everything's like triffids in here. Uh, really going great guns. Uh, those tomatoes that we took off the... Uh, these bigger tomatoes that we took off the Shirley's last week were uh, re reasonably tasty. They were still a little tad bitter, but I'm hoping we've got some more new ripe ones on here that haven't... Uh, just since last weekend. We've got a lot more of the little plum tomatoes here. Uh, <clears throat> but what I decided to do was to feed the tomatoes again and start now that I've been watering regularly I decided that I would continue to water sort of every three days and as a result of doing that you can see these little plum tomatoes are now getting much much bigger 
So it'll be uh, good to see if they taste any different to the other ones. And further up the plant, as you can see, they're a lot bigger than these little ones here, further down the plant. And these have just ripened since last week, uh, last weekend, guys. Cucumbers coming out all over the place on this. Uh, there's two there. Yeah, two, three, four, five, six. This is the one we took four off down at the lower end. And we've got another six on there at least. Seven here. So we've got seven, eight, nine. There's nine more cucumbers on this plant already, guys. So I'm pleased about that. And now that might also be as a result of giving them uh, water every three days instead of five days, every five days. We'll keep an eye on that. Plus the feed, of course, uh, the tomorite feed. Uh, so these are the little nectarine trees that I've got. I haven't actually picked any bad leaves off these as yet. Um, but they basically, they only came in here last night. Uh, and as you can see, there is one or two bad leaves on them. But I picked the best of the uh, bunch of what was left. And the ones with the most branches. So we would, um, as they grow and develop, they'll uh, hopefully spread a bit more. Now they're going to be, as I say, sort of two feet apart in the other greenhouse that I'm going to build. So they're going to, so you're going to have uh, from the say this was the greenhouse beds, which will be similar to this. So you're going to have two foot in, and then the first plant, two feet, uh, second plant, two feet, and the third plant. Um, this is the other nectarine. It's actually slightly bushier than this, uh, the first one, and this one's slightly better. And as you can see, they are, they do fruit these guys, there's one still on it. However, it's totally not edible. It's just shriveled up and gone soft as anything. Obviously, uh, due to the transportation. Um, but yeah, so there's proof that they are dwarf and they do fruit. Um, I left that on just to show you guys. It's coming off, of course, and I was going to take the stone out of that, crack it, and we'll get the seed out of it, and we'll plant that and see what happens. Uh, over here, we're just, uh, yeah, everything's really, really going good. But of course, you're still holding on there, guys, as you can see, and dropping down. As you can see. Uh, this little cucumber's even making a start now, and it's even got the cucumber on. Uh, likewise with this one, we still have one cucumber down there. Um, and it's putting uh, one or two, it did put one or two more out, and they've actually died and gone back. That's possibly as a result of the quick change in watering. Um, but further up the plant, they're now starting to come again. Uh, there is two here. One there and one there are actually starting to come out as well now, guys. And like I said, with the difference in water and these, look at, look at the size of these now compared to um, the smaller ones down below. So, yeah, maybe a bit more water and we'll, uh, it will benefit them. And what I have noticed is that even up the top of these tomatoes, they're bulking up nicely. So we maybe will continue every third day with a feed on the tomatoes. And you can see that these big beef steaky ones are now uh, really bulking up as well as a result. So yeah, we're going to, uh, conversely to what I did say last video that I was going to slow down on the watering again, I'm actually going to go to every three days instead of every five days. It does seem to be helping, especially to bulk up these tomatoes. Even higher up the truss, they're starting to fill out now. So uh, yeah, there's some more down there guys. We did take some of those peppers, but these ones are starting to flourish now as well. Uh, yeah. And just for a laugh, these three little suckers uh, that basically were planted the same time as these. It's probably way too late in the year now, but just for a laugh, I'm going to throw these three little suckers in the bed over in the growing area where we put the cucumbers and put that netting over, guys. So I'm going to throw them in and leave them to their own devices. You never know. We might get a crop off them even. There is trusses on them now. And if they get in that bed, they might actually produce something. Perhaps and perhaps not. But we'll just wait and see. Catch you later. Right, guys. We're over in the green growing area now. All right, Paul. Um, 
as you can see, these are the PVC sheets we've got ready in preparation, ready for the uh, new greenhouse we're going to build. Um, I literally just backed the car right up to this gate and threw them over here. It was much easier than carting them all the way through these, trying to get through gates with them on my shoulder and all the rest of it. It was easy to just back the car right to this gate, throw them over the top. Likewise, and when your pack of bamboos have arrived, and they'll be going into the garage very shortly. So just to give you an idea of what I'm going to do here, there's the trailer as you can see, and this was quite, this path here is quite a wide path. And that is approximately, it's just rough, but that's approximately six feet out from the garage. It, it actually leaves a bit more than two feet, it's probably near to three, three, maybe even four. Um, by approximately eight feet, which takes me to sort of halfway along the garage, uh, which comes out somewhere near the centre of that window pane. So we might need to remove, take that window out and redo it with this, mesh behind and then this on top. Um, I haven't made my mind up yet, but that's going to be roughly the size of it and where it's going to be located. And we'll get sun, all right, so they'll get plenty of sun through the morning and mid-afternoon. And then in the evening, obviously the garage is going to sh uh, shelter Although the sun, in theory, should still come through the top of the greenhouse there. But it will put them in some shade, so it'll give them some respite as well. Now, they maybe don't like respite, and maybe they prefer to have the full heat of the sun on them, I don't know. Never grew citrus for, uh, trees before, guys. Or peaches, so uh, we'll just wait and see how it goes. If we have to relocate it another time... We'll do that. What we'll probably do is plant them in bigger pots and sink the pots into the beds. And then uh, if I do need to relocate at another time, the pots can be pulled out complete with the tree and they can be rerouted elsewhere. That's the initial phase anyways, guys. So the potatoes, as you know, we've got those all lashed up. Uh, some of the foliage is looking a bit uh, drab now, but that's because they were basically fell over on themselves. The carrots seem to be uh, having a go, and they seem to be coming along nice. The onions aren't amounting to anything at all, and as you know, we didn't get lime on this just yet. We were going to do that last week, never got round to it. And then these beetroots are not really doing anything either, guys. The snow globe turnips, and a few brassicas at the end, which are just about had it. On another note, these are the new cauliflowers we've planted in our uh, makeshift cover that turned out to be an epic fail. And, uh, but you can see they're really, really growing already. They've really got themselves established already. And considering they've only been in here, I don't know, maybe... Uh, I can't even remember now, was it last week or the week before? I can't really remember. I'm just looking at those and wondering if they're insects. I might have to get a look in there, guys, in case they are. We'll do that shortly. These are our experimental bed, guys. Look at this. These are the cabbages, you remember, we transplanted. Um, this will be, it's either two weeks or three weeks. I really can't remember, to be honest with you guys. Um, but look at the size of them. All of these had like one leaf left. I cut them right back, if you remember, down to about one leaf. But look at how healthy they are and how they're coming along now. Yeah, th those, by the way, those cuts out of the leaves were the only leaves that was left on the plant. If you remember, I had to leave them for photosynthesis. I did check inside this bed and then uh, I couldn't find anything. There is one or two tiny holes coming in these, but I'm not sure why, because I can't find anything in there. Uh, the turnips, that uh, red leaf has now died off completely, but look at the growth on these. 
one of the Brussels sprouts, it's struggling slightly. That one's getting much better, but look at these ones here. Look at the size of these guys. In two, two or three weeks, I can't remember which now. But look at them, the growth. So it just goes to show that this, the beds that we're in was rubbish. And these are the three that were doing better when they first went in. And the other ones are catching them up. And these did go red when it was transplanted. Remember, they did not like the shock transplant guys. And what can I say about the next big guys? Yeah, look. It is nothing but a mass of greenery. These are our little uh, cauliflowers that was had a hard start in life. Look at them now. I know it's difficult to see with Dickie clay clogger, but this is just one mass of greenery now. These are the cauliflowers and the purple sprout and broccoli, and they are absolutely thriving. Let's see if I can give you a better shot from down here. Right, so what we've now seen is that these are now starting to go to flower and what's going to happen today is every one of these is getting harvested take the flowers off strip any bad leaves and we won't eat all those but we'll give a couple to the neighbours so they're all coming out today guys quick look in the uh, leek bed and onion bed you can see a lot of weed as a result of me disturbing that bed now. I'll we'll have to keep an eye on that and keep on top of it. Let them get a little bit bigger before we actually weed it out. Uh, the onions. Some of the onions did still get picked and nipped. But they are... Uh, look. They broke that one as well. And they took, took the tops off that one. It's still Obviously the plant is still alive but it's so annoying guys. The onions I prefer over the leeks, obviously, and I, w I was hoping for the onions. They've... Yeah, and they've pulled some out completely and they've disappeared and gone, and I don't know where they are. So I'm really annoyed with that, guys, but uh, ironically they seem to be leaving the leeks alone, and the leeks seem to be doing better than the uh, onions. Some of them are actually uh, growing quite tall now. So, yeah. Um, we're going to have a big strip out in the beds today, guys. Uh, I'm probably going to clear the bread out there completely. And I still can't make my mind up about the turnip, uh, about the radish. Beetroot, even. Whether to lime this bed and then transplant them in here with a better space in the knot, just to see if we do get anything off them. I really don't know, guys. Um, but we're going to strip out that uh, kale out of there. Uh, <coughs> our bed which you may or may not have already seen because I haven't uh, didn't upload that video yet but you should you should see that this weekend guys in here we've got uh, oh by the way I got some of the peas off the off the uh, some pea pods off the uh, peas and they were nice and sweet I was really surprised but obviously putting that little bit of lime in there made the difference and uh, yeah so in here you'll see we've also still got uh, the cauliflower that was left over and as you can see something is in that bed and has started eating that because this has been covered a week now that one there has also been semi-attacked that one's had a leaf stripped off completely that one's still fine that one's still fine that one's been decimated the cucumbers have been left alone but as you can see they've gone extremely pale guys with all the rain that we've had we've had a lot of rain over the last few days and the cucumbers obviously don't like that much water in fact if you look down here you can probably see the leaves are getting patchy um, I'm not sure whether these cucumbers are going to make it at all and the one down here next to the peas likewise it's stunted it's doing nothing guys um, I don't know whether to actually just pull this entire bed out as well give it up as a bad job dress it down with some cow manure and just fill it up and cardboard it over ready for winter i have also toyed with the ideas of removing this bed completely guys 
and thought there's a, we've got a lot of wasted space here and take this bed out completely and make smaller beds that way on giving us more beds smaller but serve uh, like onions and uh, radish and things like that um, and decided that perhaps I've wasted a lot of space in, in a way I wanted to keep the number of beds down but to be honest I haven't got as much as I, I would have liked so I'm now thinking of actually taking this bed out completely altogether and building new beds and putting one, two, three, maybe four down there guys then at some point, as you know, we've got the timber. Uh, we are going to build a bit, a bit of a, a square bed here or something with a, an elevated growing area as well or something. Uh, yeah. I've also come up with an idea that I might just um, build a bit of a, a lean-to, like a ladder-type trellis, and put the strawberries on that so that I can uh, basically net it from the top down the sides with a roll up front, similar to what we've done with it, don't, done here, guys, and to protect the strawberries. But obviously, put the green, this uh, green barrier netting across the back as well, so the birds can't come through the, from the backside. Or even a bit of wire netting first, or even wire netting would probably do it so the bees can still come in. Yeah, maybe a bit of wire netting across there, but we might put some of this as well just to try and keep that weed back off the quarry. So I've bubbled on again guys, but uh, yeah. Uh, one last thing, you can see this pear tree has really come into foliage now. These were obviously lacking a lot of water as well guys when uh, they were transplanted in the early part of the year when I had very little water. But everything's starting to leaf up again now. But we're going to get no fruit I doubt this year because uh, they were starved of the water at the critical time. So I'm not expecting any fruit off any of these. And some are doing better. As you can see, the pear is positively thriving. This apple tree's not too bad, but the one on the end's got quite a bit of foliage. And then this one down here is still struggling, as you can see. There's not a lot of foliage on this one, guys. Ideally, thinking back, when I planted these onions and whatever, yeah, I should have just uh, not bothered. I should have just dressed this bed down with a load of cow manure and got it covered with cardboard and then mulched with wood chip on top. Ready for next year. Alright guys, I've bubbled on long enough. I'll catch you later. Can anybody tell me what these are guys and identify them? I'm just discovering here, I'm coming to harvest these uh, kale now and there's quite a lot of these on there, on there but I don't know what they are guys, if anybody has any ideas if you could let me know what they are guys there's a lot of them as well getting these out just in time by the look of it but the stems are full Whatever they are. It might be that they're not actually a harmful insect, I don't know guys, but if anybody can identify what these are, please put the comments in the sections below. Much appreciated. Sods all the time, you need the camera to focus, and it isn't. Anybody identify these? Obviously, something's now uh, having a go at the leaves, and probably these, if anyone knows what they are. Please put a comment in the section below, guys, so I know how to get rid of them. I'm not really sure what these are guys, but there's hundreds of them. 
And so what I've basically done is I've tried to seal off, um, the, instead of putting the netting back down here, I've sort of tried to seal off that to try to stop them, stop them getting at these brassicas. They might not even actually be doing any damage. I really don't know. Um, but one thing that might help you to help me identify them is if you just tap the leaf, they fall off very, very easily and roll down the plant onto the ground, but then they just climb back up again. So I don't know if anybody else has encountered these before and can perhaps give me a bit of advice on these, whether they're a beneficial insect or a, uh, or a nuisance. That would be uh, much appreciated, guys. I'm not sure how well this will come out, but this is what I've found on the underside of the leaves. Um, any help identifying these guys? It seems they have laid eggs as well, uh, but it does seem there's one or two still on the leaves as well. Sorry if the camera's not uh, too good. Any help would be grateful, guys. Well, it's just came to me attention, guys, that these things are everywhere. They're even on this uh, mesh cover in here, climbing up the mesh. On this bed. And they're all over the top as well. And I can't seem to get zoomed in close enough for anybody to get a really good look at them. Let's see if they can identify what these are, guys. It appears they can jump. Are they leaf hoppers or something like that? If so, what's the best way to get rid of them? And as you can see, they're making their way to the kale stalks again. And yet, there wasn't any on the top of here. So where they've come from, I do not know. But a quick top of them, they just fall off, look. It does appear they can actually fly, these little things. I just witnessed one there flying. It does appear that they were just hopping, but it also appears now that they can fly. So, can you help me identify them, guys? Tell me the cure treatment, whatever it is, or are they harmless? They keep making for the greenery, that's all I can tell you. And I'm going to assume, look, so I'm going to assume that they're not good for the garden. So it looks like we've just got these kale stalks in the nick of time. I looked at the actual leaves and there were more damage than I thought there were, so we just took the stalks, but that's what you grow them for mainly anyway. I'll see you later, guys. Right guys, so what we've done is we've taken off the uh, two youngsters off the ice bar and the barless cock and we've put them in here. And as you can see clearly one is, is a lot lighter than the other one. However, even the darker one is lighter than your standard blue bar. And they are both carrying the ice gene. Um, if you were to pair these two together Next year, assuming they turn out to be a cock and a hen, you would end up getting pigeons with short beaks, which is what we don't want. Um, but by pairing one back to the father, we get no short beaks, but we will get some barless and perhaps in the ice colouring. Um, but in order to get a better ice colour, we will need to put one back to the mother next year assuming she can still lay next year. So she's back on two more eggs now guys, so I'm hoping to get another, at least another two youngsters out of her. As I say, she's the only one I have in that colour. And if God forbid anything happens to it, then we'll need to use the youngsters off her and breed around those to try and uh, get the ice gene. So we've got the two little brown uh, checks here, along with the brown youngster that showed them how to feed. I'm just watching to see if these two older checks start to pick on these and if they do we'll turn the tables on them and we'll put those two through in the other side and uh, they'll they should be old enough to fend for themselves and get out of the road now because they can fly 
that would just leave them a little brown with these and it would mate up or uh, become friends with these two because there's no other pigeons in the loft if I remove these two. So uh, we'll keep an eye on these for uh, 20 minutes or so and make sure that the uh, bigger ones don't start to bully the two youngsters who've just gone in. Okay guys, see you later. Alright guys, we'll give you a little bit of an update in this uh, in these stock lofts at the youngsters and how they're growing. So in here, it does look like start, it looks as though this might be an opal check. And as you can see, the females laid another egg in that nest. So that's off the opal uh, opal check and the race check in. Moving up to the top, you'll see this is off the uh, dark race hen and the other opal cock. And this looks like it could be, it's a bit earlier guys, it's either just going to be a dark check. This is the uh, mystery nest that had five eggs on and um, that's the only one that hatched out of uh, two that we left it with and it looks like it's going to be either a dark check or a very 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 dark opal but it's still a bit early to see uh, a bit early to tell the color on that one yet guys and she's laid another egg in this uh, corner so we'll sit there with an S pan in there later Moving down, we've got the little project almond cock and the yellow hen. And they're back on two eggs again now. And if you remember, they are rearing this foster youngster, which is a very pretty almond, as you can see. And this almond youngster came off this almond cock here. And he's also got another almond youngster behind him, which looks identical to him, but it looks like his hens are laid again as well in that nest pan. Now, uh, the youngster was in this one here, but it's got itself out and it's moved itself through and got in this nest pan with the eggs. Um, moving down here, we have the milkies again on two more eggs, which is good. And we've got two nice youngsters in there and we've got one of each so we've got a nice milky check and a milky bar so they're coming along nice about another week for those and they'll come off as well uh, and likewise with these these won't be too long either these two almonds so that's a quick look in here all oh, right uh, there's one more uh, and this is this here is another check. This is off the race check hen with the uh, opal cock. This hen here, and as you see, we've just seen the other one. Looks like it could be an opal check. And this is the nest mate to that one that the two uh, white bars are rearing. And it came off the nest now and moved over, so I'm thinking the hen might be sitting in this pan and I'm really hoping she's gonna lay. And then last but not least, we've got the uh, brown bar cock, who's paired to the reduced hen. And those have just chipped out this morning. So I'll have to remember not to miss them with rings. And what's noticeable right away as soon as they hatched out was, one has a dark beak and one has a very pink beak this time. So we might get some variation this time, guys. We'll wait and see. See you later. So we're in the other stock loft now guys and this is the pair, this is the almond hen and the reduced cock who are, if you remember, rearing a mystery youngster out of that nest that had five eggs in and if she'll let me, I'm just going to show you the, I would say there's no way that this youngster could have possibly came off that pair She's not going to let me As it's a recess if red so I'm going to say that that recessive red youngster there, she's let me have a look now, 
That's going to be a, a, either a recess of red or a recess of yellow. Now, it is still entirely possible that the almond cock that's paired to the brown check hen is the father mated with that hen. But looking at this, I'm going to say this is off that yellow hen and possibly the project almond cock. But it came out a recessive red or recessive yellow. Now that project almond cock would breed or could breed that colour as well. Up here, this is the one we missed the uh, ring on. But as you can see now, it's colouring up nice. And this is an indigo pied. Not an opal pied as I first thought, guys. So it's an indigo pied. You see uh, the brown barrings, but the steel grey casting. This is an indigo pied, guys. Unfortunately, we missed it with the ring. So moving down onto this nest. And in here we have a qualman pied and a black. It's either black or it's a very, very, very dark tea check. Either way, very useful in the colour breeding programme, especially with almonds. So, two nice youngsters there, guys, but two very different youngsters from the last nest. And down here we have the uh, have another nice little almond. Getting plenty of almonds out this year, guys. Never had so many. So this is... Um, another almond and this is off the real parents of that almond hen and that reduced cock and that's the one the uh, old boys looking after and as you can see the hens laid two eggs again but they're a bit messed up they probably won't hatch well they probably wouldn't have anyway because the male isn't fertile okay stuff uh, the red stuff van reed Still sitting on hers, one egg. It is full, but whether it'll hatch or not, we don't know, guys. Then we're moving up to the ice end. We've just taken her youngsters away, and she's on two more eggs. Moving round, you see the indigo hen has laid another egg on the grill. We'll put her a pan in shortly. And there's still sitting one youngster in there, which is the nest mate to this little indigo pied and that one I think is going to be an indigo then we've got the uh, the two double factor indigos paired together I'll back on two eggs again hoping to get something out of these this time these are my golden pair only had the one young start of them this year so far and just one thing I wanted to mention about this hen here, guys. So this is my number one almond hen, basically. Um, she's on two more youngsters as well. We've, I missed ringing those. I didn't get rings on, unfortunately. So that's three with no rings now. But this almond hen here is the mother of the almond cock in the other side that's paired to the brown check hen. which in turn is the father of the, some of the almonds we've taken off this year, plus the two we've got now, which is another two almonds. Uh, yeah, so there's, this, there's a white almond in there and there's another one, this color almond. Uh, yeah, so there's two there. Then there's two came off the first nest, which were both almonds as well. So she's now the grandmother of four of those almonds and the mother of that almond cock. I have had a, a lot of almonds out of this hen, and as I say, when I bought her, she had one little black mark on her. I wasn't even sure if she was an almond, but as the years have gone on, she has darkened significantly, and she's a nice almond. Uh, and, and she's also the mother of one almond this year as well. But I think these two are both going to be browns, but I might be wrong. We might even get a brown almond. I'm hoping for the crossover, guys. So that's just a quick update. So she's, uh, no, she's, no, that almond there is obviously from the uh, Dutch import hen. I've got a number of uh, almonds out of her as well. Her, so this, this, this Dutch hen and this hen that I bought um, 
two years ago have been my number uh, number one and two almond breeders, guys. Uh, they won't be going anywhere in this stem, but had some really nice almonds out of these guys. Right, guys, so I'm back in the shed. It's actually four o'clock now, believe it or not. Uh, I haven't had any motivation today to do anything, I'm afraid. So it's been a very, very quick tour around the pigeons um, and the harvesting of the kill stalks, and that's about it. If you do have any ideas what those insects are, please leave me a comment in the section and tell me, help me identify them and how I can potentially get shot of them if they're a nuisance or whether they're nothing to worry about. Worry about. Um, the fact that they keep making the way for the greenery and jumping all over it and they can fly and hop. I'm going to assume there's something like a leaf hopper or something, but what I can't understand is that all that was sprayed down um, at least twice. So I'm not sure where they've come from and whether they're coming out of that old compost and it's just really poor compost or what. Whether their eggs have hatched and now coming out of the compost at this time of year or what it is. Um, now through the green net and I have watched them actually get through it. Um, so yeah. Uh, did they come from the internals out of the soil and eggs hatch or did they come external and find the green through the mesh? I really don't know guys. If you do know what they are, please do let me know. And... Uh, if they're a nuisance, how I can get rid of them, please. So what I've decided to do is just call it a day for today. Um, I haven't got it really anything at all done other than harvest those kale, put the cans away, put the PVC uh, sheets into the garage, lock them up, take the two youngsters off the nest, give you a quick look around the stock loft in the, uh, in the polytunnel. What I've decided I'm going to do is, uh, as I say, it's four o'clock, I'm going to have a drive through to uh, the local B&Q and see if I can get some uh, 3x2 carcass. And I really haven't got any motivation today, guys. Uh, I have no energy. Uh, so it's just a short one today, guys. But uh, do stay tuned and we'll see you again. For now, guys, stay safe, be practical and keep yourselves out of harm's way as always. And we'll see you in the next video. And thanks for watching.